Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Joshua Torrance. I'm the executive director here at the Webb Dean Stevens Museum. And my name is Cynthia Riccio. I am the associate director and the director of visitor engagement here at the Webb Dean Stevens Museum. Welcome to our new free virtual lunchtime series, Serving Up History. Today's topic is the Yorktown Campaign in Rochambeau in Connecticut. The Joseph Webb House was the setting of the Weathersfield Conference in May of 1781, where General George Washington met with the Comte de Rochambeau to plan what became the Yorktown Campaign. Um, today, Dr. Francis M. Cohn will examine the genesis course and consequences of the campaign, which proved to be one of the most decisive turning points of the War of the American Revolution. Dr. Cohn is a professor of history at Tunsis Community College in Farmington. We're so pleased to have you with us today and welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Joshua and Cindy for the um, greeting. And thank you to everybody who's participating today. Thank you for taking some time out of your schedule. So this is a big topic and we don't have all day to cover it and we're gonna do the best we can. Let me see if I can share my PowerPoint slides here. Oh, let's see. Uh, we got a problem. Okay, I gotta find my slides here. This is the trouble with the technology. We'll be fine once I can find what I'm looking for. Here we go, be fine. All right, we're in good shape. Let's go to the beginning. So I'm gonna take sort of an orthodox approach. I worked on this quite a few times and reworked it and changed it about. So what we're gonna do is sort of a two part present, uh, presentation today. We're gonna to look at the Yorktown campaign in a relatively short amount of time, which is complicated, but I'll try to boil it down to its essential elements. And then we're gonna back up and look at Washington, Rochambeau, and particularly Rochambeau in, in Connecticut, in the French in Connecticut. I dare say that's probably why um, quite a few people were, were interested in this topic. So again, we're not gonna do it exactly chronological order. We'll do the, the big picture first, and then we'll look at the specific Rochambeau and Connecticut. Just a little background. The American Revolutionary War broke out in April 1775. And for the first roughly three years, it was a war between Great Britain and these 13 rebellious American colonies. But one has to remember that beginning in February 1778, the complexion and the nature of the war changed because it became a global war. Uh, Britain was not only fighting to quell this rebellion in America, it was also once again at war in Europe and in other places with the French. And obviously for the purposes of our story, the French alliance with America is, is really important. So the French enter the war in 1778, the Spanish the year after, and even the Dutch declare war on Britain in 1780. So the war goes from a rebellion to a global war. Um, and Britain has challenges all over the place. So there's fighting in the Caribbean, the Sugar Islands, which are really lucrative. The Spanish and the French besieged Gibraltar, this British naval base that controls access to the Mediterranean. And there's even a possibility that the Spanish or the French might invade Britain or, or Ireland. So now, once this becomes a global war, British strategy has to shift. They actually have to pull soldiers and ships out of North America, out of the America, and send them elsewhere. And so as this war dragged on into 1779, 80, 81, there was really a stalemate in America. On the one hand, the British could not come up with a strategy that would break American resistance. But on the other hand, the Americans certainly as this war dragged on were facing exhaustion. Financially, they were bankrupt. Uh, they were finding it very hard to put armies in the field 
and, and keep men in, in uniform and supply and equip them and, and motivate them to keep fighting. So what would break the stalemate ultimately is the Yorktown campaign. It was really one of the decisive campaigns of the war and arguably the most decisive. So what we're gonna be looking at here is a bunch of chess pieces that come together in the spring, summer and fall of 1781. So let's just kind of go through this. Don't worry, there's not a quiz. You don't have to worry about this. You can do reading. I actually have a little list of resources at the end of this presentation. But if we go to July, 1781, again, the war is essentially in a stalemate in America. It has been for at least two or three years. George Washington's going to muster a portion of his pretty small army um, around White Plains, New York. This is, again, July of 1781, about 2,500 men. Now he's going to be joined by the Count de Rochambeau, uh, the French ally, who had arrived the year before in Newport, Rhode Island, which you see on the map, which became the French base. Oh, let's put Rochambeau up there again. He has about 4,200 soldiers. These are professional soldiers. They're good. Their goal is to link up with American forces down in Virginia under the Marquis de Lafayette, young French nobleman who came over here and volunteered his services to America. He's got about 5,700 men. Many of them are militia though. They're not particularly well-trained. They're no match for the British. But nonetheless, the whole object here is to um, gain numerical superiority in Virginia over the British. Rochebeau and Washington also knew that a French fleet was bound for America by the autumn from the Caribbean under the Count de Gras. 24 ships of the line, these are sort of the battleships of the time, and also de Gras had about 3,200 French soldiers. So again, the whole object is to gain numerical superiority in Virginia over the British, both on land and by sea. Again, de Gras has soldiers with him. The object is Yorktown. Now in Yorktown, and you see him on the right, you see all these men I'm mentioning, most of them anyway. Um, General Lord Charles Cornwallis had about 7,000 British soldiers. He had fortified Yorktown as a naval base. Um, actually, his superior officer you see there, the commander in North America, Sir Henry Clinton, had ordered him to do so because Clinton realized if Cornwallis was pressed too hard by the Americans or the French, if, if there was a seaport there, the uh, Cornwallis' force could be evacuated back to the main British base, which was in New York. That's actually where the main army was under Clinton. So again, if Cornwallis is pressed too hard at Yorktown, so long as the British control the sea, they can be evacuated from Yorktown. Or Cornwallis could be reinforced from New York. But again, that was only so long as the British controlled the sea, which they did initially. But they'd lose control of that uh, during this campaign. So back to Washington, Rochambeau, they're going to march south to meet Lafayette to muster their forces against Cornwallis in Yorktown. So about 2,500 men are left behind uh, under General William Heath in the Hudson Highlands, the area around West Point, which the Americans had fortified, rugged terrain. And then they begin this march. Uh, the 18th of August, it'd be about six weeks it would take these two armies to march to, to Yorktown. Some of them went by sea along the Chesapeake. And keep in mind the planning that was necessary was incredible. This was one of the major logistical efforts of the war because campsites had to be laid out for these armies, food had to be available, water had to be available, you know, fodder for animals, actually uh, draft animals had to be procured, wagons. And this, this really strained American resources tremendously. Um, what helped was French money. And actually, believe it or not, Rochambeau took half of his war chest, which he had brought to America, and loaned it to the Americans so they could supply their forces and actually pay their soldiers something 
before they started on this campaign. So they all go south. And Clinton in New York is caught unaware. So by the time he realizes what's happening, it's too late for him to do much. We mentioned that French fleet, which arrived actually late August off the Chesapeake Bay, off of Yorktown. Now all of a sudden Cornwallis is in trouble. The French and the American armies are approaching Virginia, and now the French fleet is offshore. But the British show up under General, I should say Admiral Graves. They come from New York. There's a naval battle off the Chesapeake Capes, which is indecisive really. Each side batters the other, ships are damaged, quite a few casualties. But it's the British, who as you see here are outnumbered, who break off the action. Graves goes back to New York to repair his fleet. And this proves to be decisive. So keep in mind, Washington and Rochambeau are approaching Yorktown. And now, at least temporarily, the French control the sea. So Cornwallis is trapped. Um, if he can't defeat the Franco-American army on land, he can't be evacuated by sea and he can't be reinforced. And that's precisely what happened. So the Franco-American army besieges Yorktown, they dig in, now Cornwallis had fortified Yorktown, but they begin a formal siege. They dig what are called saps, trenches, they move their artillery pieces up. By the way, the French had um, heavy siege guns which they brought from Yorktown, uh, actually Newport, I should say. And long story short, unless the um, British Navy can win control of the seas again, Cornwallis is doomed sooner or later. He, he doesn't have the strength to break out and defeat these armies in the open. He can't be evacuated, he can't be reinforced. So after a siege of about three weeks, he's forced to surrender his whole army. And here's an illustration of the surrender ceremony, 19th of October, 1781. So the consequences are enormous. First of all, Cornwallis is surrendering about 8,000 men. Um, most of them professional British soldiers, some Germans, some loyalists, Americans. But at this point in the war, 8,000 men are gonna be really hard to replace. Also, this causes the king to lose control of parliament, the opposition faction, the Whigs come into power, and they demand to, to George III, make peace in America. We've lost the war. And ultimately, the British decide anyway, um, we need to concentrate our strategy on defeating threats elsewhere. America probably is a lost cause, so, but we need to make sure we don't lose the war in Gibraltar, for example or in the Caribbean, and that's what they do. So even though the, though the war will drag on two more years before the Treaty of Paris is signed in 1783, now essentially Yorktown ends the war in America. They're still fighting on the frontier with the Indians. The British are still here in a couple of places, uh, Charleston, South Carolina, New York, but the fighting is pretty much over. All right, that's our overview of the campaign. And certainly if there's time at the end, I can answer any questions you have. And some people might be putting questions in the chat, which is good. But um, Mrs. Riccio mentioned the plan and the planning for what became the Yorktown campaign indeed happened in Weathersfield, Connecticut in, in the Joseph Webb house, which you see here. So in May of 1781, George Washington, uh, moving out of the Hudson Highlands, where the American army was located, traveled into Connecticut to Weathersfield. And from the other direction, the Count de Rochambeau would travel from Newport, Rhode Island, and they'd meet up you know, roughly halfway in Weathersfield, Connecticut, where they have a conference to decide the strategy. And the strategy was Rochambeau would muster his forces at Newport and they would march across Connecticut, as it turned out. And the two armies would gather right about White Plains, New York. Now, Washington's actual preference was not to attack Cornwallis in Yorktown. His preference was with French assistance to attack 
the main British army in New York. We'll come back to that. But ultimately that didn't happen. So again, his preference was New York. Ultimately, the two agreed, let's strike a blow at Yorktown. And that, that worked out brilliant, that proved to be decisive. These are just a couple of entries from Washington's diary, which are interesting. The first is from the 19th of May. Again, breakfast at Litchfield, that's Connecticut. Dined at Farmington, I don't know where. Uh, we know it wasn't McDonald's. And lodged at Weathersfield at the house of Joseph Webb Esquire. So there we go. And then the 22nd of May is the conference with the Count de Rochambeau. And they fix upon the plan of campaign that the French land force should march to the North River, that's the Hudson, and there in conjunction with the American to commence an operation against New York. And again, that was really Washington's preference. And then just going forward a little, or option B, which is the one they ultimately chose, to extend our views to the southward as circumstances and a naval superiority, that's de Grasse fleet approaching, might render more necessary and eligible. And it, there are benefits and disadvantages to each strategy. But again, ultimately, they decide on work time. Well, why not New York? Just briefly, one, the Graz fleet hadn't arrived. In New York, the city, certainly. And keep in mind, the city was the very lower part of Manhattan at this time. Most of Manhattan was still a world, believe it or not. You know, without French naval support, it was going to be difficult to capture New York City. Also, the British had occupied New York City since 1776. They had fortified it. And then finally, even with French support, the British actually outnumbered the Franco-American army. So New York, New York just proved too tough a nut to crack. And ultimately, rather than try this, um, the two armies would march south and execute the Yorktown operation. All right, let's get to the, maybe the most interesting part of this. So we mentioned that as part of any plan here, whether to track New York or Virginia, Rochambeau's army was going to have to march across Connecticut to meet up with Washington's in New York or outside of New York City. And that's what happened. So, in June of July, 1781, you have this small army marching across Connecticut. It's four infantry regiments. It's an artillery battalion, a few laborers. And this unit was uh, Lazoon's Legion. It was really interesting. It was almost like a foreign legion in that most of the soldiers were actually from other European countries. It was a combined arms force, light cavalry, light artillery and picked infantry, sort of an elite. So grand total, it's only about 4,400 men. This total would include men are detached duty or sick. So the effective strength is about 4,400 men. So it's not a huge force, but it's a professional force. It's well supplied, it's well led. And again, it's led by the Count de Rochambeau. Uh, we can back up a step. He was a, a long, serving officer, he had enlisted in his uh, teens, had a lot of experience, was quite capable, excellent planner. And uh, among other things, he was excellent at working with the Americans. That was his task, was to cooperate with Americans and help them in any way he could. And he certainly did that. Kind of hard to make out this map, but this is a map that actually the French created in 1782 to depict the march of actually all the way to Yorktown. So this segment pretty much just shows the march through Connecticut. So from Newport to Providence, and then this was the route the infantry units took right through the middle of Connecticut. And it's kind of hard to see the camps, but I can briefly go over them. I have them listed on another slide. They first camped in Plainfield, Wyndham, Bolton, East Hartford, Farmington, Southington, Middlebury, Newtown, and then 
lastly, Ridgebury near Ridgefield, and then they would be into New York State at that point. And the regiments were spaced out a day's march apart. So uh, over the course of usually four days, each of these regiments would occupy a campsite. The reason they spread them out was logistics. Now, keep in mind, again, before these armies marched, there had to be campsites laid out, and the French were meticulous about this. There had to be food in place, there had to be um, firewood, there had to be animals to be slaughtered for food. And uh, also they didn't wanna clog the roads. These are a lot of soldiers. They also didn't wanna overwhelm the local people because the French actually would purchase supplies from them. Lazun's legion took this route a little farther south, but again, the army, the, the combined force at Rochambeau would meet up when the armies uh, were at Ridgebury. But indeed, they marched right through Connecticut. Again, those are the campsites on um, the way to New York. Interestingly, too, the French brought engineers with them, cartographers, who sketched the route of the march and actually sketched the campsites and the, the towns or villages they camped in. So I'm just going to show you a couple of those. This is Farmington. It's kind of hard to see, but this was Farmington as it was in 1781. So this is near and dear to my heart because Tunxis Community College is in Farmington. And this campsite is literally just down Route 6. It's not far at all. So you see some of the, the modern features listed here. This is sort of Rattlesnake Mountain. And this is the middle of Farmington today, if you're familiar with Farmington, with the congregational churches and Miss Porter's school. This is more or less where they camped. They probably camped a little south of here, but, but nonetheless. So I'll just show you one more. This is East Hartford. And again, they would have camped here earlier than Farmington. But let's tell you a little story, which may be apocryphal, but Silver Lane in East Hartford. The story, which again may be apocryphal, may or may not be true, is when the French camped here, again, they mingled with the local residents and they purchased things. They didn't steal and they were on their best behavior. And they were able to purchase things because they had coin, silver coin. So that may be where the name came from. The residents were, you know, coin was really rare in colonial America and revolutionary America. You know, money, hard money, coin, the gold and silver was really rare. So to be paid in silver was, you know, like a king's ransom. So that might be where the name Silver Lane came from. Not sure. Just an aside, but an interesting one. Among the officers with Rochambeau, um, who were cartographers, were doing these sketch maps, was this fellow, who would have been in his late 20s, Louis Alexandre Berthier. Um, again, by the time he left America, he had been promoted to a uh, the rank of colonel, but he was a cartographer. He was doing these sketch maps, including that one of Farmington. He actually did that one. He wasn't really a notable figure at this time, but he would become notable with Napoleon's rise to power because he would become Napoleon's chief of staff, believe it or not. He was actually the mastermind, the logistician, the planner that would take Napoleon's orders and make sure they were executed. And he was a brilliant, brilliant organizer. And he would become a marshal of France. So it's kind of cool that Napoleon's right-hand man was actually in Connecticut in 1781. Just about done, but once Yorktown was won, the French army wintered there, but in the summer and fall of 1782, they'd actually march back and they'd march back through Connecticut. And in many cases where you see the asterisks, they actually camped in the same places they camped in 1781, and in some cases, new places. Now they were bound for Boston because that's actually where they embark and they'd go back to France in December of 1782. But actually they came twice, the French. They came through in 81 and then came through again on their way home victorious in 1782. A 
just put together a little list of sources, um, mostly web sources, some print sources. You can, if you know how, do a screenshot, you can copy this down, or I do have my email at the bottom. So if you want any of this information, if you want any more information about this presentation, feel free to email me and I will respond and uh, happy to help you in any way I can. That is it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. That was just really, really great. And we're uh, so pleased that you could join us and now uh, anxious to take some questions. So we have another screen up. So pardon as we look to the side, but um, we're, we'll feed you some questions. So we have a one question that's come right in. Can you give us some idea of what these campsites would look like? Well, again, they were, you know, the French were professionals, so they'd all be meticulously planned and organized. You're going to have to have a, a source of water. You're going to have to dig latrines. Um, you're going to have to have firewood. You know, they would have set up tents. The, the officers, certainly the um, regimental officers and above, would have been lodged in, in houses, in people's houses. But the soldiers and the NCOs and so on, it would have been tents. Um, and actually the engineers went ahead. So if the roads were out or had to be patched, they take care of that. It was really, really meticulously planned. So they, would they leave the tents standing and just the new occupants of the tents would come? I think actually, no, each regiment would have its own tents. They'd pack up yeah. and uh, the next regiment would arrive typically the next day and the same pattern would, would take place. Wow. Yeah, pretty incredible. Uh, we have a question. Do you have an opinion on um, Philbrook's book on Yorktown from a couple years ago? I haven't read it, so I really can't say, but um, so I really can't comment. There are a lot of good books on Yorktown, but definitely. So a couple um, questions came in um, talking, asking about the Sun Tavern in Farmington, if that was of any importance. Yeah, I, again, I don't know the history of that, so um, I'd have to look into that. And um, also, we had a, uh, a, uh, a couple, I guess, they're watching from Williamsburg, just 12 miles from Yorktown. Cool. Uh, a Frenchman's map has been a major source of information by Colonial Williamsburg with their restoration of the historic area. So, uh, that that is really great. Similar, probably one of the 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 maps that you similar to the map that you showed us to the site. Right, and that map was actually created by French cartographer 1782. What they did is took those route maps uh, and combined them into a finished product. We also, did, um, so they went through East Hartford. We had a question, did they march down New Britain Avenue in West Hartford? Did they march I, through I, I don't know, honestly. Yeah. But again, it, it would have been from East Hartford. The next campsite would have been Farmington. And I think they crossed the river to Connecticut at Hartford. I have a question. Uh, did uh, Washington's desire to attack New York um, have any merit with the French or did the French always prefer Yorktown over New York? The latter. Rochambeau was always skeptical of that operation succeeding, but he wanted to cooperate with Washington. He was willing to try. So actually the two armies, they reconnoitered in July. There was some skirmishing. And I think what Rochambeau was uh, hoping for happened it was Washington would come to a census and say, all right, you know, this, this is not possible. And again, Rochambeau was counting on that French naval support, which was decisive. Another person asked if Rochambeau spoke English. I, I, I probably not to any extent. Again, I don't know for sure. Um, maybe a little bit. It's much more likely Washington's officers spoke French, particularly his officers, because French was a lingua franca at this time. You know, if you were an educated 
European. Chances are pretty good you knew French. There was a question that I will attempt to answer. Maybe you know the answer to too. And the question was, um, was there a personal connection with, um, with Joseph Webb and uh, with Washington and wondering you know, why, why the Webb House? And I'll start, Cindy, you probably know better. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna that, leave uh, that to the experts. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Washington had previously been engaged and stayed in Weathersfield and had a prior relationship Joseph Webb, actually Washington ordered boots from Joseph Webb. Um, and so there was a prior relationship. The Webb house was um, uh, British captured British officers actually were held at uh, the Webb house. And uh, it also was the site of many entertainments of uh, 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 American officers. So the Webb house was well known to the, to the uh, American forces. And the connection with Sam Webb um, as well, um, who became an aide de camp to George Washington. So right. there's a um, connection there His as well. Brother. Yes. Mm -hmm. And somebody um, sent back that Washington had a translator in his staff. So thank you, Shelley, for, um, for letting us know. Yeah, that would make sense. But you know, a lot of the officers, the more educated certainly, would have, would have known French. So uh, we have a question that um, she, would, she would like to know, uh, Shelley would like to know if you um, agree that there was a really good line of communication between the French and the Americans and the ships offshore that allowed uh, help in, in, the, uh, in the siege of Yorktown. Yeah, I mean, and again, I didn't get into a lot of the fortuitous events that happened, but, um, you know, it was letters that were being sent. And keep in mind the amount of time it would take to send a letter, let's say from um, France to the Caribbean or from the Caribbean to America, but th that's how they were communicating. So de Grand knew he was going to be in the Caribbean. He'd be offshore America sometime in the fall. But beyond that, he couldn't say on this day, I'm gonna be here. There was just no way of knowing. These are sailing ships. It was gonna depend on the weather, um, and a whole bunch of other things. But as it turned out, he actually showed up sort of early. And um, believe it or not, the, the, uh, a British fleet from the Caribbean had sailed by Yorktown just before that. Didn't find the French, were looking for his fleet, and they sailed on to New York. So that's one of those fortuitous turns of events. If the British had showed up first, you know, they might have been able to fend off the Gras, it's hard to say. Well, thank you so much. And thank you, uh, Dr. Cohn, for this really great discussion, um, for sharing your knowledge and your, your enthusiasm. Uh, I can tell we can have lots of fun in the future. <laughs> yes, I'll be happy to for do sure. more. Sure. And um, I want to thank all of you for asking such good questions and giving us some insights. Thank you for joining us. You will get a follow-up email. This has been recorded, so you can share it. Uh, if you'd like to become a member uh, or make a donation, that will also be in the email, and we certainly would appreciate that. Uh, and Cindy, next week. Yes, next week on March 3rd, we will be celebrating Women's History Month with a talk called A Right to Ourselves about women's suffrage in the birth control movement. And mm -hmm. that will be presented by Dr. Heather Monroe Prescott from Central Connecticut State University. So please join us. Thank you again, everyone, and uh, we'll see you next time on Serving Up History. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.